gently close your eyes do deep breathing we'll chant om once together synchronize the chanting of om with your exhalation breathe in सहनावतु सहनो भुनक्तु सह वीर्यम करवावह तेजस्वीनावदी तमस्तु मावित विशावह ओम शांति 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 gently open your eyes we'll chant from verses 68 to 72 of chapter 2 tasmadhyasya mahabaho tasmadhyasya mahabaho निगृहीताशिया तज्ञा प्रतिष्ठिता प्रज्ञा प्रतिष्ठिता निशाभूता तस्ति संयमी यस्यामृति भूता सा निशा पश्य मुने सा निशा पश्य मुने आपूर्यमाणमचल प्रतिष्ठ आपूर्यमाणमचल प्रतिष्ठ समुद्रमाप प्रवशति यद्रमाप प्रवशति सर्वे सशांति मापनोति न काम कामी सशांति मापनोति न काम कामी विहाय कामान्य सर्वान् विहाय कामान्य सर्वान् पुमाम चरति निस्पृह पुमाम चरति निस्पृह निर्मो निरहंकार निर्मो निरहंकार सशांति मधि गति एषा ब्राह्मी स्थिति पार्थ एषा ब्राह्मी स्थिति 
पाथ नई नाम प्राप्य विमुह्यति ृछति हरिओं and a very good day to all of you so we are doing this verse which is a very very powerful verse you know when you are result oriented in life you cannot perceive the the power of these verses straight away because any long term benefit as the name itself suggests will take time to manifest a person who is result oriented will want immediate benefits a verse like this may not cater to your immediate requirement you may uh, we are using the yogic approach i'm also explaining these things relatively from the sadhana point of view that is there but uh, the frequency from which he is talking actually uh, what is uh, what is the aim what is he aiming at he is aiming at shaking you up shaking your very roots it is very few people who can actually get into the real spirit of these verses now right now if i were to ask you who are you you will give me your name and if i ask you to explain further you may say this is me and um, i have studied this is my educational qualification uh, this is where i reside so all these things you will give but if you were to think deeply whatever you are saying as yourself that is whatever you are referring to as yourself is actually the waker it is not the real you now right now you strongly feel that i am this person but when you went through the dream experience when you were the dreamer you strongly felt that i am that person the dreamer see this happened with uh, king janaka one day king janaka had a dream and in the dream he was a beggar begging for food and then suddenly in the middle of the night he woke up and when he woke up he saw that he was in the palace he was uh, lying on the bed so immediately he called all the wise people his ministers and uh, whoever used to counsel him he can he uh, convened a meeting and all of them were wondering why at uh, such an hour in the middle of the night is our king calling for a meeting something um, an emergency situation must have come probably they thought 
some uh, someone has attacked uh, the city or whatever it is so when they all assembled he said i have a doubt i have a question and i want you to answer that and that question is i had a dream that i was a beggar and in that dream i was in the streets i was actually begging for food i was begging for money my clothes were torn now when i woke up i am a king i am king janaka i am living in this palace with all the uh, material comforts now my question is am i king janaka who dreamt that i was a beggar or am i that beggar who is dreaming now that i am king janaka it was a very very powerful question no actually there nobody understood the question because anybody would say what is this question of course you are king janaka who dreamt but what he was trying to um, ask us that is the the basis from which he was trying to ask us this when he went through the dream experience as a beggar now that was real to him this waking world uh, king janaka the riches all these were not existent uh, existing for him that experience was as real as this experience for him which he was experiencing as king janaka as long as he was in the dream uh, the the beggar experience was real the moment he woke up now that he is calling a dream and this becomes real to this became real to him so that is why this question came which is real am i king janaka who dreamt that i was a beggar or am i that beggar who is now dreaming that i am king janaka so one wise minister he came up to janaka and he said sir this question cannot be answered by us you need an enlightened person to answer this you need a guru see we can give advice on some worldly matters here and there but what you are asking is something so deep this questions the very existence of our being now uh, we are not qualified to answer this so to which king janaka said okay please take some time can you go around and look for some enlightened person who will be able to answer this question the minister said yes so they went around and uh, finally they located sage ashtavakra who was a god realized saint ashtavakra story itself is very very inspiring we will see that in some other context but then they said our king has this question the moment ashtavakra heard the question of janaka he immediately got up and he said come we'll go you know usually gurus will not go to the student the student only has to approach the guru king janaka had no ego if uh, the ministers had gone and told him he would have immediately rushed to ashtavakra but here the moment that question was told ashtavakra felt the energy of king janaka he was a real real supatra supatra means the vessel which was ready empty and ready where he could pour once the student is ready it the meeting between the guru and the student has to happen so either the student will go or the guru will go to the student it doesn't matter the guru has no ego why 
it is suggested in our tradition that the student should approach the student should bow down to the teacher all these things is to develop that humility otherwise the arrogance will come it's not the not that the teacher requires any of this once the student is ready there is no formality so he went to king janaka and janaka was unnerved he said sir if you had told i would have come he said all that is okay but tell me what is your question can i want to hear it first hand to which king janaka repeated the same question am i king janaka who dreamt that i was a beggar or am i that beggar who is dreaming that i am king janaka imagine he actually ashtavakra came after one week now one week back janaka had dreamt but his penetrative capacity was so strong that even after one week the effect of the dream was still there 100% usually you forget the dream your your you forget your dreams very fast even if it's a most terrifying dream within a few seconds uh, you will forget but here janaka remembered not merely the details of the dream but the intensity of the dream the intensity with which he had experienced the dream world as a real you know that was there in his mind and that is why he asked the question with the same fervor which he had asked in the middle of the night immediately after the dream and the moment he asked the question am i king janaka or am i the beggar say jashtavakra told him you are neither you are neither the dreamer who was a beggar nor are you king janaka who is a waker you go through three states of consciousness the waking state the dream state and the deep sleep state would you uh, you belong to the turiya the fourth state that the, um, that is called actually ashtavakra gita it's a very very high level uh, scripture it should now you know these scripture these scriptures like ashtavakra gita upanishads even the bhagavad gita all these things are not meant to be studied merely intellectually now uh, we have to use the yogic approach penetrate and uh, uh, absorb the energy it's it's a meditation process you know it's an inward journey so ashtavakra explains to him and in the process of explaining it was not an intellectual explanation he initiated king janaka into the highest uh, uh the diksha the the highest level of wisdom and janaka was ready to receive the whole thing and the second portion of the ashtavakra gita is after you know janaka experiences the uh, the turiya state he becomes an enlightened being and then he gives out a little bit of his experience it is the same question which is being posed right now to you are you this waker or are you this dreamer now you will say what a, what is this question sir i am of course the waker i was the one who dreamt yesterday and i became the dreamer but when you went through the dream experience the waker didn't exist for you the dream world was everything for you the dreamer uh, you felt you were the dreamer it's not a mere feeling but you were, you had identified with the dreamer if i had come into your dream and asked you who are you you would have said i am so and so uh, referring to the dreamer and when you are going through the deep sleep state of consciousness you become the deep sleeper i am the deep sleeper 
even though you don't uh, actually feel it exactly that way we uh, later on just for understanding sake we are putting it like that so when you are going through the waking state that i has identified with the waker when you are going through the dream state that i identifies with the dreamer when you are going through the deep sleep state of consciousness that i identifies with the deep sleeper nothingness ignorance you know so the entire process of jagra the awakening which is talking about is separating the i from the waker dreamer and deep sleeper and when the i becomes completely unconditioned then that is the state of turiya that's what is said in the bible you know when uh, moses when he heard the 10 commandments and all that the incident is that he asked god as it were you know when i go and tell when i go and give you a message to people and if people ask me who is god what am i to tell them so can you tell me who you are immediately the voice of god said tell them that i am that i am i am that i am the unconditioned consciousness so it's like a, they have they put it like a drama it's not the voice of god is not outside it is a inner conversation which they have projected outside and they are giving it in a story form so that people can easily understand the entire bhagavad gita is not outside they have used certain incidents from history uh to give out this highest wisdom the upanishads the vedas are not outside you they are all inside you only so the inward journey is separating that i from all conditioning i am not the waker i am not the dreamer i am not the deep sleeper then who am i i am that i am i am that supreme consciousness this is what ramana maharishi was constantly meditating on nan yar means who am i it is not something to be discussed about it is a very very deep process of self introspection this is the true meaning of swadhyaya swa adhyaya study of oneself who am i if you don't understand it if you don't get hang of it you will say what is all this nonsense who am i and all that there are many people so called uh, intellectuals atheists they think they are uh, more uh, you know intelligent and they say what is all this nonsense who am i why should you ask all this but for a person whose subtle intellect is awakened the sukshma buddhi as the great yogis call it buddhi has uh, can be divided into two one is the tikshna buddhi the gross intellect which you employ in the world you can employ the tikshna buddhi in the world to take various decisions but the other is the sukshma buddhi the subtle intellect when that subtle intellect is awakened within a person then only he can get to the spirit of what these great yogis are saying so the entire process which a master um, gives a student is all aimed at 
taking the student inward and making the student experience what he or she truly is see when you when uh, when you take the externality that is where differences come man woman um uh, you belong to this religion that religion this is your mother tongue that is your mother tongue you belong to this country that country all these things caste creed everything is external but when you start going deeper and deeper when you start deconditioning that i there there is no man no woman there is no caste no creed no religion it is all one that is why in the upanishads they are uh, they, they, they are focused on removing whatever concepts which you have rather than explaining what that fourth state is because when everything else is removed what remains is the truth see supposing you have the uh, a lot of uh, let us say colored balls in a box now all are in different different colors there is one ball which is white in color now you don't know which one it is so pick the white ball means you are unable to do that so what the uh, great masters are saying is you don't worry about that white ball instead whatever other colors you know red color yellow color balls then the blue colors go on removing them so you remove you see all the green color balls and you remove them where the red color balls and you remove them you have never seen a white color ball so you don't know what it is so whatever colors you know everything you remove and then what remains is the white ball so similarly you know not the fourth state so this question will come into your mind when i don't know not only i do not know but it is beyond the intellect then something which is inconceivable which is unknowable how can i ever experience that the master say don't worry you need not focus on getting to know the truth remove all that which is untrue remove all your conditioning that is the whole sadhana when you remove all the other balls then what remains is the white ball so when you remove everything which is not the truth then what remains is that i that pure i i am that i am aham swayam prakashit self illuminating so these verses are meant to push you inward see last few weeks i have been uh, stepping up the energy so many of you would have been shaken it it the, the this may have caused uh, a, a slight disturbance what what is all this what is life you know now more than this if i increase further uh, it, you you will find it difficult to handle that energy so as we go along you know we do the other sadhana release the gross form of uh, dirt the conditioning and then we go to the next level so as you get prepared um uh, you uh, as you get prepared by releasing whatever is negative within you only then you will you you will uh, you will be able to grasp 
or uh, or absorb this highest energy so ya nisha sarvabhutanam tasyam jagarti sanyami in that which is night for all beings the self control one is awake so this the sita pragnya is one who has completely deconditioned himself or herself the pure i is what he experiences and whenever any master um, gets into that frequency and talks whenever he utters the word i he does not mean the physical body or the limited personality he means that supreme infinite self you know throughout the bhagavad gita krishna says you think of me i am i, I can give you moksha it is not the personality krishna which he is talking about he is identifying with that supreme consciousness because krishna was an avatar avatar means being born with that full awareness of the turiya state the infinite descending into the finite form so jesus christ also said the same thing come to me i will save you buddha said the same thing mahavira said the same thing every scripture you go you will find the same message see when you read the scriptures externally intellectually there will be a lot of differences actually if you read the bhagavad gita then you read the bhagavatam then uh, you read the vedas um, you read various scriptures you you will find that they are totally different even among the puranas if you read the vishnu purana uh, that will be telling you one thing if you read the shiva purana it will be telling you the opposite in vishnu purana it will be said uh worship vishnu in shiva purana it will be said worship shiva now which one are you going to follow if you go to devi bhagavatam uh, is this no don't worship shiva vishnu and all, uh, all these people now worship the devi the goddess which one are you going to follow if you use the yogic approach if you are a sadhak you will understand that the inner message of all these puranas of the entire four vedas of all these scriptures of all religions it's all one and the same and that is to get back to that deconditioned state unconditioned consciousness the state of turiya so even when we chant om it is a representative of this somebody has uh, asked uh, a question you know he has put it in the youtube comment section i'm just reading the question it is asked by tayar ravi ji i think uh, you're from uh, new jersey if i'm right new, new york right new york so uh, what he has asked is uh, he has explained the points and all that and then uh my sincere pranams to yogi shri for spending so much time with us teaching and inspiring us with all these sessions and the question that i have is does om represent the dream deep uh, sleep and waking state wakes uh, wakeful states with turiya or silence appearing at the end it's a nice question because this is the very theme of the upanishads in the mandukya upanishad which is considered as uh, uh one of the principal upanishads it's a very short upanishad he covers this see the mandukya upanishad is so powerful every upanishad is extremely powerful it was so short 
then the great sage gaudapada he wrote a commentary on the mandukya upanishad that is called karika gaudapada karika so together they call it mandukya um, karika upanishad so in the mandukya upanishad in those few verses he talks of the deeper significance of om now if i if i were if i have to explain uh what om is one session is not enough many many sessions we need to devote for it we'll see that in the future uh in the higher empowerment uh sessions i will uh, take a complete course on the omkara sadhana it's very very powerful and that has to be done in stages because the om is such a powerful mantra which contains the entire energy of the cosmos and it has to be very slowly slowly opened up the the mantra shakti the the, the power which is embedded which is uh, it like a capsule you know so the deeper philosophical significance behind om that is what i am referring here we are we are not getting into the mantra shastra part very interesting now om basically uh, contains uh, three syllables a u and m so a and u when they join in uh, the sanskritam language the, the grammar it becomes o so a u m put together is om so even though uh, according to the grammar it is om that is it is not wrong if you chant it as om for yogic purposes for sadhana purposes we try to bring in both the a and u when we are chanting the uh, that's uh, that part we say a so that all the three sounds are experienced now before the sound what existed was silence and then from the silence the om comes and then it goes back into that silence so what is this om a represents the waking state of consciousness i am just very briefly explaining this because this question has been asked uh in the future we'll see when we do the upanishads uh we will get into more and more depth that will take you to a totally different frequency so a if you see if you chant a as a, from a layman's point of view we don't need to see from where a is originating that we are entering into mantra shastra it, it comes from the lower part of your body and all that but from a layman's point of view if you chant a now that you you will feel it coming from this part that is the throat and then when you say o it will be coming from the middle of your mouth and then when you say m mm, it will be coming from the, the the this portion the end of your mouth and to your skull and all that so the sound originates from here in the middle it is u and then m mm, it tapers off so therefore they used these three syllables to symbolize the waking state dream state and deep sleep state so a represents the waking state where you are fully expressing yourself as it were it is symbolic you know and then when you say u it is in the middle the dream state you are expressing yourself but not fully and then when you say m mm, you are expressing yourself to yourself only see supposing i just uh, don't say anything and then when i chant m mm, 
you cannot see any expression. If the audio is muted, you will not know when I am chanting mm and when I am not chanting mm. So, that uh, that is dying down. The expressions are dying down in mm. So, when you say ah, that is full expression, waking state, ooh, uh, dream state of consciousness, mm, deep sleep state of consciousness, where the expression is almost nil. So, when the, the Om Mantra, which contains three, these three syllables, actually represent the waking state, the dream state and deep sleep state. And what is behind this, these sounds is that silence, which represents the fourth state, the Turiya. So, the, uh, so what you have asked, sir, is, uh, the, is, uh, is the Turiya represented by the silence at the end. It is not, the silence is not merely at the end. Before the sound came, there was silence. When the Om was being chanted also, that silence is there in the background. And then when the chanting stops, again there is silence. The first there is supreme silence. And then, Om. Again, total silence. So that silence represents the fourth state. The silence which you experience in uh, is still a part of the waking state only. That's why I am saying it represents the fourth state. So, when you go to a master, when you surrender to the master, then the master, uh, uh, you know, with the energy transfer, he makes you meditative. See, when you uh, meditate on your own, your experience will be one thing. But when you connect to a master, your experience will deepen. In the empowerment courses, you will find your, you know, your experience uh, of meditation will be at a much, much higher level than what you would normally experience. Why is that? Because the master is established in that state of Turiya, that silence. So, whatever mantra he chants, it is not only the mantra, everything which he says is also a mantra only, any expression. It's all coming from that state of supreme silence. So, as you hear the mantra from the master, you are not receiving merely the sound energy. Actually, you are receiving the silence as it were. That's why immediately your mind will calm down. The master may say something, the master may not say something. It, all these things do not matter. And that silence which you experience is a glimpse of what that fourth state could be. To an initial level, you will experience a certain amount of silence. And then as you get more and more purified when you do your sadhana, the master will go on increasing the energy. And that is when you start delving deeper into the silence. It's like going deep into the ocean. And he will go on helping you to go inward. And then when the final point comes, he will push you deep into the ocean. Thereafter, a master cannot give you any experience. You will have to experience the infinite as it is. And when I say you, that you itself has to dissolve completely. That is the state of being Swayam Prakashit. So, all the beings are not aware of all this. See, beings are aware of only the A, U, M, the waking state, the dream state and the deep sleep state. But it is only the Supreme One who is aware of that silence which is behind this entire manifested world.
so that is the the true sadhana of jagra that is that is what is meant by getting awakened so in meditation you are not going to sleep the sleep is different from meditation sleep means actually you are losing your consciousness in meditation you your awareness or consciousness goes on increasing and expanding many people they just completely sleep off and then they say that oh i meditated for 3 uh, hours today they have slept you know <laughs> see uh, actually in uh, in patanjali yoga sutras uh, bhagwan patanjali what he says is sleep is one of the obstacle which will uh, come and uh, confuse the meditator you know it doesn't matter uh, there's nothing wrong with that you've not done anything wrong but real real meditation is this only i am not asking you to practice this right now but as we go along in the higher courses all this will be revealed to you in stages so that you start uh, experiencing it actually in today's meditation a small initiation will be given to uh, for that uh, expansion you know every week i am giving a little bit just to uh, get this process of self enquiry started within you so this sadhana of jagra from a relative level Uh, is something which you need to absorb so i i told you the from the absolute level it it means the highest from the relative level it means to become more watchful attentive so in everything which you do do it in a in a mindful way in a meditative way meditative way doesn't mean you are uh, disconnected from the world no you are connected to the world that is why in the west uh, somebody had coined the word mindfulness i think so so th- that is the that is the preliminary meditation whenever you are doing any activity do it with full attention attentiveness do it very carefully in a watchful way it's a beautiful sadhana so that you practice i will give you uh, one more dimension of this uh, word jagra which will be very useful to you uh, from a sadhana point of view that is jagra means to foresee uh, to be provident provident means you uh think about the future and then prepare yourself for the future i think that is how the word provident fund also came you know when you are working in your offices and all that a certain portion of your salary they uh, uh cut uh, they uh, they don't give it to you right they say this is uh, the provident fund now that will come back to you only after your retirement so they are uh, it's a forced saving for the future you know they take a small portion and they say this will uh, help you uh, in the future it's a future saving the word jagra means that to foresee now the general idea uh, of spirituality is you know many people uh, say don't think of the past don't think of the future only think of the present nowhere in the scriptures it is said like that what is said in the scriptures is don't keep worrying about the past that is don't think about the past in the sense you must you may have heard me also saying that what it means is don't allow your mind to go on its own to the past similarly all the time don't keep worrying about the future you're so anxious about the future you know but 
in the same scriptures they are say, they are saying jagra be awake means see to plan for the future is one thing and to be anxious about the future is another thing what does it mean by foresee to be provident i'll explain in detail this sadhana uh, you need to uh, understand this it, it's a very very practical thing see when you're functioning in the present if you live your life fully here if you live your life in a perfect way now your future will also be wonderful because what whatever you do today uh the that is going to have an impact to uh, on the future so it is very important for you to be watchful in the present to be very attentive in the present but you should have a foresight that is what he means to foresee you should also be very clear about where you are going a goal is very much necessary without a goal you will become directionless you know some people say uh, does a bird have a goal does an animal think about the future then why are you thinking about the future even an animal thinks about the future but only when it's necessary see when uh, 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 supposing you take a bird when the uh, uh, lady the, that is the f- uh, female bird is pregnant the male bird starts building a nest not only with birds with any other creature you take you you take a squirrel you take uh, all other creatures they start building homes to for the eggs to be hatched or for the young ones to be uh, born before uh, they are born so they are foreseeing see they are doing it in a unconscious way because nature has designed them to be like that so it is not that uh, uh, the birds and animals don't think of the future they do think of the future when it's uh, necessary they don't sit and worry about the future all the time they don't spoil the present happiness by bringing in the future anxieties or the past worries a yogi is also like that a yogi is one who clearly plans for the future but he lives moment to moment and enjoys that is how you should train your mind so these are all wrong concepts because of a total uh, uh, misunderstanding of these uh, scriptural truths people have started practicing wrong things either uh, in the name of planning for the future they become highly stressed or in the name of spirituality that is i want to live in the present they stop planning for the future and they get into a lot of trouble so this part of jagra this dimension of jagra that is to foresee to be provident can be applied in every aspect of your life for example the financial aspect how if you want to apply this to be provident how will you do that you need see whatever your earnings are take out a certain percentage first and put it as a saving this is what is mentioned in our scriptures somebody has put forward a question uh, what does the ancient wisdom have to say about financial planning our yogis have given so many wonderful tips probably uh, we'll see in the future i will uh, i will take it as a separate course the ancient wisdom in financial planning it will be very very useful it's all based on the higher principles only see these principles can be applied in every area of your life it's an application so what the uh, what you should do is see you should say when can you do that see even though we are saying to be provident save it is not so simple you can practice that only if you keep your desires below your income supposing you are earning 100 rupees 
If you keep your desires to 50 rupees, then you can save 30 rupees. Remaining for you can put for your other expenses and all that needs. But if your desires are more than your income, then you cannot practice this jagra. The problem is you earn 100, but your desires which you pitch up are of 200. So you go for full loans and all that. The loans are you know, literally like waters, the, the wa supposing you take a dip in the water and the water is right up to your neck, you are unable to move, you know. Always remember, your loan should be preferably no loans, that is the best way. If at all you take your loans, it should be like waters, which is there only up to your ankle level or uh, a little more higher. You can easily manage. But as the water level goes higher and higher, your freedom will be curved. You will become very, it will become very, very difficult. So either people are spendthrifts in the name of uh, being in the present or in the name of saving. Some people what they do is they become uh, 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 very, very stingy, conjuice, you know. That is also too much of value for money. Being in the center means using the money effectively for your present enjoyments, to fulfill your present needs and at the same time also foreseeing and saving a certain amount for your future. That is called Sanyami. Sanyami means a self-controlled one. Neither becoming a spendthrift nor becoming uh, too stingy, a conjuice, you know. I am giving you a very, very practical example because, um, you know, these verses are so uh, powerful. I am talking of the waking state, dream state, deep sleep, the turiya and all that. You, should, <laughs> you have to be a little careful. You may lose sight of practicality. You may say, oh, I am in the state of turiya and you neglect all your duties, you, you waste all your money which you are earning your, uh, you know, your other duties also, you don't do properly, then you will get into trouble. So that is why this word Jagra has to be applied at the absolute level for inspiration so that your ultimate purpose in life is fixed in the background and it also has to be applied at the relative level for you to practically uh, manage your life. Spirituality uh, enhances the quality of your life and ultimately it gives you that um, supreme experience, the experience of that supreme God. So, to foresee, to be provident, everything which you do in life, whether it is in finance or in relationships, See, if you uh, spend some quality time with your near and dear ones, your relationships will get enriched. That is Jagra. You are foreseeing that and uh, you are, uh, as it, just as you invest money, so save money, similarly you save a little bit of your time, uh, the, the quality time is very important with your near and dear ones. It will give you happiness, it will also give them happiness, the relationships. Will, uh, will become wonderful. In every area of your life, you can apply this Jagra. So be very, very attentive, watchful uh, in whatever you are doing in the present, but also foresee, have a goal. See, if you are if, if from the financial level, you should have financial goals. From, from a relationship level, you should have relationship goals. In your career, you should have career goals. At every aspect of your life, you should, you should set a direction. If you don't set a direction, then life will take you wherever it wants you to take. Actually, you are anyway creating every moment. When your thoughts are running in a haphazard way, you will create things which you don't want in life. But when you follow this principle of Jagra and you fix goals in every area of life and the ultimate purpose, ultimate goal in your life is to reach the Turiya state. Then, you, in, at a relative level, you will be well organized, you, you will be 
progressing you will experience life fully you will work out all your karmas and from the absolute sense you you will be deconditioning yourself you will become more and more humble you you will you you will start dissolving your ego and you will become ready for the highest experience so this is the powerful sadhana of jagra when we come to the uh, third chapter we will be seeing more of this because uh, uh, some of those verses actually give you very very powerful practical tips as to how to be more effective in, uh, in life if you read it superficially you cannot understand anything like as i told you don't think of the past don't think of the future means now if you supposing you forget all your past now where will you go next you you don't even know you will not even remember your house you will not remember your parents you will not remember your spouse <laughs> then what will happen to you so these things are just in a you know uh, superficial uh, sup- uh, understanding things in a superficial way but we will have to go into the depth so practice this jagra see the difference between nisha and jagra in the first line is that to not know you don't need to put any effort jagra to be awake effort is required so by the by choosing those two words in the first line what is he trying to convey any kind of evolution spiritual evolution requires effort from you whereas to stagnate and devolve doesn't require any effort from you does anybody have to teach you to be indisciplined supposing we have a seminar how to be indisciplined in life you will laugh you will say what sort of a seminar is i know in order to be indisciplined i don't need any guidance do you require any guidance to become stressed these things will happen without your effort automatically but moment we say discipline yourself that is where you require guidance you require to put an effort be completely calm be unaffected by the external challenges that is where effort is required so spiritual sadhana the the evolution part requires effort from you devolution does not require any effort therefore the deeper message from a practical point of from a, from a sadhana point of view is that if you stop putting in effort in life in let it be any area in life you will first stagnate and then you will start devolving so constant effort is required there is uh, a question which a person had asked in the youtube section only that i'm trying to be more aware but i'm finding it difficult and yes initially it will be difficult that effort is involved but slowly 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 as you master you know whatever was difficult to you earlier will become easy now be you know uh, i told you no things will become effortless that means you have Uh, put in so much of effort that you have become a master in that area so whenever you are tamasic in any area of your life remember you are actually choosing destruction in life because tamas will not merely cause stagnation see if you are at 10% level and you don't put in any effort to evolve it is not that you will like, you will remain at 10% slowly slowly you will start devolving it's like a gravitational pull you know it will it will start pulling your consciousness down wherever water stagnates you find that slowly slowly it starts gathering moss it becomes dirty when water is constantly running running water is always fresh 
It's the same thing with respect to your mind, with respect to your physical body. In the, the third chapter, we'll be saying, he says, even the maintenance of your body is difficult, is not possible without action. So action at the physical level, action at the emotional level, action at the intellectual level is very much necessary. And more so at the spiritual level, your daily sadhana, the attempt to perfect yourself, to purify yourself on a daily basis should be there. So, in every area of your life, this is a small sadhana tip I am giving you. If you want to become a yogi, you should try and better yourself uh, uh, than what you were um, yesterday. That is, you should try and keep updating yourself. You should try and learn new, new skills in those areas in life. Then life also will become very interesting. You will also keep your awareness and alertness, you know, alive. If you make a mistake once, it is okay. But if you make the same mistake twice, it is a crime from a spiritual point of view. You know, when we started this on uh, this whole, uh, uh, all this online, many, many people uh, were sending messages to the organizers because they were not familiar with the online system. They had not used uh, the internet and all that so much. So they were getting used to that. That was okay. Mm -hmm. But after one and a half years, if you are still not familiar with all this, it means you, 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 you know, you have allowed the tamas to overpower you. So, in every area of your life, go on upgrading yourself, go on learning something new, whether it's your career, whether it's uh, your finance, whether it is uh, a relationship. See, every time you relate to a person, actually you can learn uh, human psychology. It's an endless science, you know. You can never say, I have understood a person fully. Bernard Shaw, he said, uh, the, the wisest person whom the, I have met, that is the most intelligent person I have met in my life, is my tailor. Because every time I go, he takes fresh measurements. It's a beautiful statement, beautiful way of putting it. So, go on taking fresh measurements in life. Put that effort. The moment you stop that effort in that area, first you will stagnate and then you will devolve. Remember this. So, the Jagra means to, uh, the ult from ultimate state, it is ultimate awakening. From relative state, three dimensions have been given to you. Practice them. First dimension is to be watchful and attentive in everything which you do. That itself will increase the quality of your actions tremendously. See, it doesn't matter whether others are there, somebody is watching you and all that. Everything which you do, whether you are alone or in front of everyone, you should try to do it perfectly. Like a, um, a bird is singing, a cuckoo is singing. A cuckoo is not singing for an audience. Whether you are listening to the cuckoo or not, it will continue to sing as perfectly as possible. That is what the life of a yogi is. Then the second dimension is foresee, to foresee, to be provident. So from, uh, I gave you the example uh, at the financial level. Why I am giving you at the financial level is because I, I, you know, when I was uh, sensing the energy, many, many sadhaks are, uh, you know, they are on the borderline of becoming impractical with these high truths. On one hand, you are absorbing the higher truths. On the other hand, you are not applying it properly. So, you start from your financial level, that is a, a grossest, no, lowest area. So, first you start from there. Keep your desires well under your income. 
and as your income increases you can keep you can if you you can f- fix higher and higher goals when i use the word desires i don't mean karma karma means um, desire going out of your control i mean ichcha ichcha shakti willful desire that is a goal you know which you fix when it is karma when it is out of your control you will start looking at what others are having and you will also uh, develop those desires without any reference to wo- uh, what your earnings are see when you are earning money respect give that respect to money don't be a spendthrift nor should you be uh, a conjuice a stingy person use the the wealth effectively wealth is goddess lakshmi if you are not even able to uh, preserve and use the external wealth properly how can you develop the inner lakshmi the inner wealth similarly in other areas also you practice uh, uh, the uh, the fixing goals so that you get a, a proper direction in life and then the third dimension which is never ever slacken your efforts in any aspect of your life more so in spirituality always try to improve in every aspect of your life see a yogi is one who is continuously evolving he goes on learning something new there is nothing called retirement externally they may have fixed an age at 60 i am retiring at uh, 21 or some people okay you do your higher studies 24 ah uh, i have now finished my education it is a wrong concept keep yourself engaged in activity and go on learning something new your life will become so interesting every moment which has been given to you is a divine gift use that to learn something and improve yourself that is when you will become more and more alive and when you fix the highest goal as long as that highest goal is there in the background you will you will not get lost in all these things you will you, you will utilize your resources to uh, complete your experiences to work out your karmas you know every week uh, when you are attending these uh, sessions it is being ensured that the ultimate purpose in life is fixed in the deeper layers of your mind so even if you fall as long as you are attending these sessions the guru shakti the higher energy will pull you back so thus you you go on evolving you you awaken as a total person so that is the sadhana of jagrat now uh, next week we will see the second line uh, first i wanted you to practice these things in the second line the same word jagra and nisha are used but in the opposite sense so there you will have to fo- uh, follow the sadhana of nisha that is why don't get caught up with words it is a concept that matters so it it will be very very interesting first you master the first line you master mean at least uh, to put in some effort you know practice then next week when you come back we will go to the next line and uh, he uh, you know uh, it's like you are seeing an object f- uh, directly and then you turn the object and you see it that will give you more depth that will give you more tools for sadhana okay so that we will see in the uh, coming weeks and then uh, uh, the the three aspects of a uh, of a stitha pragna are are uh, being beautifully covered in this verse that also 
a small insight I'll give you. That should be more than enough. Enough material is being given for you to transform your life. That way there's one verse we can go on and on for the next one year also. But uh, I'm, I'm giving that much which you can absorb and uh, utilize for your self-transformation. And then we will move to the other verses also. Okay. So before we do the meditation, today's meditation is going to be very powerful. Uh, we will uh, see the Jagra, the awakening, a small initiation I'll give you from the highest standpoint and also from a relative standpoint. As far as finance is concerned, since many people have asked that question also, how to plan out finances, I'm, we, we will just focus on one principle that is keeping your desires lesser than your income. Simple. So first you practice that and then we will see uh, more principles as we go along. I will just answer uh, a few questions. One question I will take up today. Humble Pranams Yogishri. I am a homemaker. I also do some voluntary service that help children with rare genetic disorders. I am also a spiritually inclined seeker. Once you had mentioned that 25% of your earnings need to be spent on spiritual progress in one's life. Yes. So my husband who is the breadwinner of my family is not into seeking path right now, but does not object to my spending money for spiritual or charity purposes. How rightful is it on my part to spend the money he has earned for these purposes is a nagging query in me. I am grateful to get your clarification in this regard. Always thankful for all that I am receiving from you, Yogishri. I am not mentioning the name of the questioner uh, for obvious reasons. Now, it is a good question which uh, she has asked. The first thing is, uh, you have said I am a homemaker. Now, my request to you and all the other uh, ladies who are homemakers, earlier the terminology used was housewife, now they are saying homemaker. Some people say, no, homemaker is also wrong. It should be home manager, home CEO, something they are coming up with. Okay, whatever it is, <laughs> any word you use, it's a concept that matters. The first thing you need to uh, uh, understand is, there is no difference between being a homemaker and going out and working. See, you are thinking your husband is earning, whereas I am a homemaker. This concept itself is wrong. Your husband is working and he is getting a salary directly, no doubt. He is getting the money directly. Supposing you don't take care of the home, now if he sits and does all that, will he be able to go there and earn? So you are also contributing. It is you and your husband put together who are earning. Well, see, you may either be directly earning or you may be contributing due to which your husband is earning. So your husband's, it is wrong to say it is my husband's earning which I am using. It is your earning which you are using first. First principle, please put this in your mind. This is a complex which many, many ladies have, you know. It is, it is because uh, in between the previous generations, uh, males became very egoistic and uh, men became very egoistic and it became a male dominant society, you know. So they started passing comments like, after all you are at home, you are not earning. These kinds of thoughts have been imprinted in the deeper layers of the mind. So remove all that. It is logically wrong. So because many ladies ask me, you know, sir, uh, uh, I, I, you know, which is better to be a homemaker or to be a working woman? There is no difference. Do you mean to say homemakers don't work? It is directly earning or indirectly earning. Earning is still earning. 
So the very uh, basis from which this question has been asked needs uh, needs to be questioned first. The basis itself is wrong. My husband is a uh, uh, you know uh, husband is earning in my family, and I am just a homemaker. No, you are also earning. Number one. Number two. Yes, I had mentioned that 25% should be used for uh, spiritual growth. See, this has been given by our yogis, how to effectively manage your finance. I am only very briefly covering certain portion for savings for the future, certain portion to take care of your present requirements, present needs and also present enjoyment. Because ultimately you are earning money for enjoyment, you know, that is a key aspect. And then a certain portion has to be used for spiritual sadhana because that is your ultimate purpose in life. So if you don't use the wealth for uh, uh, spiritual uh, sadhana, then uh, you will get completely enmeshed in worldliness. You will never evolve spiritually. So these are some of the basic principles which were given by the our yogis. So now... Uh, your question is, my husband who is a breadwinner of my family, strike that line. Say, my husband and myself, we are the breadwinners of our family. The moment you put that line, you this question itself will get dissolved. Then you are asking, uh, he, is, uh, he is not into the spiritual path, but he is not objecting to my spending money for spiritual or charity purposes. There is nothing to object or not object. Plan your finances properly. When I say you, I mean uh, whether your husband is earning or your it is all uh, the families only. So, uh, how rightful is it on my part to spend the money he has earned? See, you are differentiating, you are causing a difference unnecessarily. So, come, please come out of this uh, complex. So, there is no query at all if you understand this concept. See, if you take it to an extreme, I will give you uh, what is the implication of what you are saying. You are saying, how can I use the money which he has earned for spiritual purposes? Then I will ask you one question. How can you use the money which he has earned to prepare food and eat? How can you eat the food? Because you are buying that food with his money only. Have you ever asked such a question? That question wouldn't have come. I hope I am not complicating the problem. But what I am trying to say is, the question is so absurd. So, if you can use the money to fulfill your bodily needs, of course you can use the money to fulfill your the needs of your soul. You are not merely this body. You are a combination of the body, the mind, the thoughts, the soul. So, uh, your finances have to be properly utilized. So, when you are utilizing the money for higher purposes, which is uh, for spiritual sadhana, actually what are you doing? You are expanding your consciousness. You are evolving spiritually. Your capacity to function in your life will become better. You will start radiating the positive healing energy, which in turn will benefit your husband and other family members. So this question is coming out of ignorance, wrong understanding of uh, what spirituality is because spiritual when you uh, invest your finances for spiritual evolution that is going to in turn benefit your family members your the society in which you are living in and it is also stemming from a deep rooted complex differentiating between homemaker and uh, uh, and earnings you know so first get this right concept you know, put that in your mind. I have already put that. So, don't remove that. that. That is your part, you know. Okay, this is also, this would have also solved uh, doubts which many other people may be having. And my request to the husbands who are directly earning and whose wives are uh, homemakers, my request to the husbands is that you should respect your spouse, you should respect your partner. 
the respect should be mutual since a lady has asked this question i am giving the other side of it if a man had asked some question i would have said the wife should respect the husband so see partners means equal nobody is inferior or superior so that outlook itself has to be changed don't consider yourself as superior don't consider yourself as inferior also be very confident be proud to be yourself i am using the word uh, uh, proud here in a positive sense you know in the sense of being confident anybody who goes and works because he or she feels doing some other work is inferior will never be happy in spite of all the work which you do you will remain unhappy so expand your consciousness don't separate yourself it will not help you okay so other questions i'll take up uh, later we will do the meditation so sit straight these meditations have started preparing actually you for the empowerment course which is coming in another 3 uh, months so uh, sit straight this is something which you need to practice to keep your spinal cord erect in a relaxed way and place your palms on your thighs facing upwards fingers naturally curled and gently close your eyes I am totally relaxed. I am very watchful and attentive in this present moment. from this moment onwards everything which i do every word which i speak i choose 
to do that in a watchful attentive meditative way from this moment onwards i choose to keep my desires ichha well within my income from this moment onwards i choose to enjoy and put an effort and go on learning something new in every area of my life waking state beyond the dream state beyond the deep sleep state lies the fourth state of consciousness the turiya
I am not the waker. I am not the dreamer. I am not the deep sleeper. I am that I am. Swayam Prakashit. I am self illuminating. Offer your gratitude to God Supreme. Offer your gratitude to your Guru and all the Holy Masters. Slowly come back. Wriggle your fingers, your toes, rub your palms together to create a warmth. Cup your eyes with your palms. Gently rub your eyes, your cheeks, forehead, top of the head, back of the head and neck. Slowly open your eyes. Welcome back. So we had a very deep session today. So 
So as I've been repeatedly saying, you should always maintain a balance between the higher aspects of spirituality and the lower practical sadhana aspects of spirituality. That will ensure that you live a full life in the world and you will also evolve and reach the highest state of Turiya. You should never become imbalanced. When you are acting in the world, act fully. Because the more you fulfill your obligations in the world, the lesser disturbances you will have when you sit and meditate. That is why these great yogis have laid so much of importance in balancing the worldly life and the spiritual life. Do your sadhana on a daily basis, personal sadhana, and then when you go to the world and interact, remember, it is an interactive sadhana that is going to help you complete your experiences and uh, prepare you and your personal sadhana is going to uplift your consciousness. That combination is the key. So the prana tattva level one which we are going to have in December is going to be a very very powerful program where the doors of your higher bodies, the pranavayu sharira will be opened to you. So from your side, you need to do your sadhana and come prepared. Many people have already registered last week itself. So remember, as soon as you register, it means you are committing mentally. Don't register mechanically, but consciously, as I said, you know, be watchful, attentive in everything which you do. So when you're registering for the event, let it be a commitment from your soul to the Guru. Yes, I am willing to do this higher sadhana. So when you commit like that, then uh, you, you know, you will benefit maximum. So from the day or from the moment you register, the healing Shakti will start flowing. I have already, uh, you know, started sending the healing energy to those people who are, uh, who have committed. So you will be able to feel a lot of difference in your pranic level, in your breathing patterns and all that. And soon, uh, whatever instructions, any other instruction they get in meditation regarding if any preparatory practices are required, all that. As and when it comes, I will be sharing it. So the most important thing is for you to commit and do your sadhana on a regular basis. I have already started the healing uh, process. So those of you who have registered, just do your sadhana uh, on a daily basis and uh, at least once a month do the Kaya Tattva meditations also. It will be very useful uh, when we go to the Prana Tattva level. Uh, this is important. You will find uh, the, you know, a lot of healing happening and before you come for the empowerment itself, uh, when major blocks are removed, it will be easy for you to receive the higher Shakti. Because 21 days of um, Prana Tattva can completely transform you. But don't look at it merely from the 21-22 days, and it is 22 day program. Don't look at it 
from a narrow perspective of 22 days start preparing from now itself from uh, this end uh, i have already started that process to from your end you need to be very humble and uh, receive whatever is being given and uh, do your part which is the sadhana okay so we'll continue next week thank you very much hari om